Welcome to the TEDx stage, Brandon Oldenburg. Here we are. Why does chocolate milk taste better, not through one straw, but through two? <laughs> now, the, there's, there's scientific theory, maybe, but, but, but we've done our own research at Moonbot to back this up, and I'm going to do my best to walk you through the process and theory and concept. And uh, it's practiced every day at elementary school cafeterias. I remember myself doing it, not really knowing, but, but, but now, in hindsight, being a little bit older, I'm like, wait a second, yeah, it did taste better through two straws. I'm going to start at the beginning. The year was 1972. The day was November 29th, and um, this thing came out, Pong. <laughs> I was also born on that same day. I grew up in a house where the television wasn't just a passive experience. It was also an active experience. You could actually do things on the screen. This was before the personal computer and all these other things. And I got to grow up with a family, uh, siblings, uh, that, that loved technology, that loved the arts, and loved the merger of these two mediums. I guess they're mediums. I saw a Steven Spielberg film called Raiders of the Lost Ark. I was in third grade. It blew my mind. I walked out of the theater and knew exactly what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, and it wasn't archaeology. <laughs> my dad took me to a used camera store. We got a Super 8, started making home movies in the backyard, in the neighboring fields, wooded areas with my friends. This all sounds probably familiar, like a movie that may have come out recently. But uh, it, it's pretty much the same story, minus the aliens that eat people. Three years ago, there's this uh, strange place in a small town called Shreveport. And, 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 and this place within this town I'm talking about is a studio called Moonbot. It's three years old. There are now 48 employees. And um, I'm one of the three founders. There we are, the three founders. <laughs> Lampton on the left is the self-proclaimed wheels on the bus. William Joyce in the middle is the self-proclaimed swamp rat. And somehow I'm a, I'm a part of the mixture. And um, I, I love to say this, and they would love to, you know, not, not for this to happen, but they always are mistaken for my father. <laughs> we are, I believe, trying to figure out a business plan here in this photograph. <laughs> I'm going to go back in time. 1998. Everything started, especially with Moonbot, with, with, a, with a, a foundation of play. I sent an invitation to my favorite children's book author and illustrator, and I didn't know at the time, uh, a gentleman who was involved heavily in the uh, advent of film, that was um, movies that were made out of computer animation. And uh, I, I sent him the fan letter to NL Fan Letters. I said, would you like to play? I'm in Dallas, I hear you're in Shreveport, maybe we could work something out. We would love to make a short film or something. We started uh, immediately throwing around ideas, realizing we were cut from the same cloth. We uh, basically built um, an entire lunar landscape in a soundstage in New Orleans and made an animated test that we call The Man in the Moon. It's about the origins of the character, The Man in the Moon. This idea paved the way for a film that's about to come out. And I'm not here to talk to you about that movie, but it is pretty exciting. Moonbot Studios' first project was a short film. We knew that we needed to make something to share with the world, to show the world what we're all about and what we love. And so we decided that a short, a finished short, would make sense to get it out into the world, but it was going to be expensive. And we explained this to those who were offering up some cash. And they were like, okay, all right. So we explained you know, how these other studios started. And they're like, okay, okay. But, but, but we had this audacious goal, somewhat Im improbable. It was almost as if, like we said, we want to build a rocket ship and we want to get to the moon. And we've never done it before, but trust us. But we said we would like to make a short film. We'd like for it to get out into the world. We'd like for it to be a calling card. We'd like for it to maybe get nominated for an Oscar. 
Here's a still from the short. Here's some artwork that went into the creation of the short. As you can see, it's a lot of fun. I highly recommend making short films, animated ones. They're a lot of fun. And this process, the process of making this film, reminded me of what it was like to be a kid. And actually, it's kind of funny to say that, because I feel like I still am. Um, I don't feel like I'm old enough to even actually be up here and talk to you. <laughs> there was an evening, I recall. It was a fall night. It was a dinner party of sorts. There were adults in the house. There were kids in the yard. One thing led to another. I guess the ad adults as assumed there was a teenager supervising, but we would wander off and we would create mischief. Um, you know, we would jump off the roof with umbrellas for parachutes. We would throw rocks at ongoing, uh, oncoming um, muscle cars if they ran the stop signs. In, in a way, we were pretending as though we were James Bond or, you know, superheroes of the, of the neighborhood, but this sort of thrilling adventure was, was dangerous. So, you know, there's probably five or so times in the evening that we narrowly escaped death. And our parents would come out at the end of the evening and say, how are you guys, kids doing? We're like, oh, we're good. And there's no, nothing, as if nothing happened. But this was a thrilling experience. It was dangerous. But through that risk came great rewards. We have these memories. We, we fought villains. You know, and I'm, you see where I'm going. Okay. So, jumping ahead. It's, it's all fun and all, making a short film, but it's also, you know, any kind of project is difficult, too. And there are the late nights. This photograph was probably taken around 3 a.m. And there's one of our most incredible artists, Joe Bloom, working hard on storyboards. It's a mess in this room, and, and, we, came to and we came to realize and embrace these, these messes. The messier, the better. The more we went through ideas, the more we went through bad ideas and bad ideas. And eventually, we knew once we got through 90 of the bad ideas, maybe 91 was going to be a good one. And it, and, it, and it normally was. So we'd keep throwing them on the floor, keep throwing it on the floor. So when we walk into any of our story rooms, in our studio, we, we, we feel as though we're being productive the messier it gets. It's also, um, I think, the catalyst for this experience before we moved into production was the fact that we threw all of our boards up on reels. We watched it, we brought in our friends, and after it was over, it was dead quiet um, it, because uh, we were all crying. And when we were crying, we all looked at each other and we realized we were doing something right. Now, note the device this child has in her lap. It's an iPad. It did not exist when we were in production. It did come out halfway through. The short is, being, is playing on this iPad. It's not, not an app. But the short is playing, and um, this little girl is coming to the end of the third act here, watching our short, and I just wanted you guys to see this. What's wrong? <laughs> what happened? This is such a sad joke. <laughs> <laughs> she said it's such a sad story. And, it, and it, it can be seen that way, and I think it is a little bit. We went through a lot of difficult times getting to this moment, creating this short film. Uh, <clears throat> I, I saw this, actually. This was just posted by a friend of ours, um, and just like last week, and I'm so glad to be able to share it with you, but I, I felt horrible after seeing this. <laughs> and then my wife said, well, go rub your Oscar and everything will be okay. <laughs> so, shorts are expensive, and, and they don't make any money. You get them out into the world through small little film festivals, and they work their way across the planet, and, you know, 40 people are here seeing it, 40 people there seeing it. That's cool and all. But it was really expensive to make that, and we were like, uh, I hope the phone will ring after people see this. But, but this thing came out, the iPad and the apps and all of this stuff, and we thought, well, maybe we could repurpose the assets. So we, we dove headfirst trying to figure out how to do that. And within four or so months after we had released the short into the world, we were able to release the iPad story app experience of the same film. The iPad app did so well, it eclipsed the short. People think that the short is based on the app. Now, we have dads and moms and grandfathers and school teachers. These photos came to us from across the planet. We pushed a button in Shreveport, and overnight, it's, it's, it's hitting it's, hitting the, it's, 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 it's uh, touching the world globally, and it's, uh, it's uh, a strange thing to witness. 
especially when people embrace what you love, because it's hard to be objective when you're creating art. Sure, it's emotional for us. Sure, we cried, but are other people going to cry too? <clears throat> We've also crossed the species barrier. <laughs> Here, Mahala, seen on the left, really loves Morris Lessmore. And there's this, and this is awesome and great, and I'm not here to brag about this, but this is an important part of the narrative for tonight. The, 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 this happened. And all the while, we, we get into a couple of film festivals that allow us to get access to be potentially on a short list to be nominated for an Oscar. And there's this day when they um, get up at 5 a.m. in Los Angeles and they announce, well, the top 10 award nominees. Our category is not necessarily that 10, it's a little lower down, and what happens is there's a PDF that's launched on the website at the same time. So here we are, all of the employees of Moonbot got up early, had breakfast, this is in the main entrance of our studio, and we're refreshing our browsers. Here we go. We were pretty excited. <clears throat> this happened. We learned to levitate. And people ask us, have you come down yet? And do we say, do we have to? All right, there's this other thing that we created. And, it, and, it, and the catalyst for this came through a phone call that people asked, well, what are you guys doing for the holidays? And we were like, well, what do you mean? I'm going to my in-laws. You're like, no, what are you doing? Like, what's going to go into iTunes? Are you going to, like, you know, double down on Morris? Are you going to make something new? We looked at the calendar, and we're like, that's four months away. Well, we should try something. So we did. And so we created this app about the invention of the alphabet. And uh, we knew that we didn't have much time, but you know, it was kind of good because things have been going so well, we knew we were going to have a sophomore slump. So if we're going to have a sophomore slump, let's just get it over with as quickly as possible. It's like ripping the Band-Aid off. <laughs> That's my daughter, Riley. Oh, it's going to be a V. It's going to be a V, Daddy. So Numberly's is all about the invention of the alphabet, and you get to partake in this. And, and, and we didn't necessarily have time to do, uh, you know, um, uh, exploration of as far as interactive, interacting with children and see how they liked it. The reason why we probably avoided that is because most of our employees are children. I think of myself as a child still the child that thinks that, you know, chocolate milk tastes better through two straws. And Riley here will also agree, it does taste better through two straws. And so here's, here's another clip here with um, uh, a, a son of one of our uh, programmer's friends playing with number leads. He's turning the number eight into a B. This reaction is, is exactly it, what we wanted. Did he did it. B! <laughs> <laughs> all right, so the, the, this, uh, this idea of b having a company all about creating stories is, is, is sort of cool and all, but it's, it doesn't sound like a really solid business plan. And, it, and, and we like to say we're agnostic to the mediums, which means we like to just tell stories. We don't want to say that we're, we do iOS. We don't want to say that we do PlayStation games. We don't want to say we, we're filmmakers and we just do short films. We like to do all of those things. We like to just tell our stories and we like to stay nimble and we like to stay quick and we like to hold our finger up to the wind and see where it's blowing. And so therefore we made a book and we, we have a really great sort of line of books we're going to do based on all the stories that we developed. And this one book is, uh, is, is really important because it obviously it's, it's a, the story of Morris Lessmore is all about the love of story. It's all about the curative power of story and how we all have stories that we have to tell. So it just, in a way, the book is our business plan. That it, that's what we're all about. So we couldn't just do a book. We, we decided, you know what, we need to have a companion app that goes along with this book as well. 
because we've been hearing from librarians. They, they, they saw how well our app did, and they were like, you guys are going to, what are you going to, you're going to ruin it. You're going to ruin it. You, the books will not exist. And we're here to tell you today that they will exist, because with this app, you need to have a book. You are brought back to the printed page with this technology. So we call it the Imaginotron, and it's a companion app that will go along with all of our books. Now, if you launch this app and you aim your camera at your book, any page, the book will come to life. So, you know, technology has all this really cool stuff it can do, and you have all these bells and whistles at your disposal, and it's really important to, um, you know, have discipline and, and, and restraint when playing with this technology. This is exciting for us because this guy, this, these little legs that are spraying, he's inviting you to read him. He's like, dude, open me up. You've got to actually touch a book and open it. So that's really exciting. And uh, since we started to play in this new realm, we've been, the phone started to ring, by the way, after that, that night. And, and uh, Sony PlayStation invited us to partake in exploration in designing a new experience with a new technology. And they announced this recently at GamesCon, and I want you guys to see just a piece of this clip. It's, um, it, it, it appears like, it, it feels like alchemy. You sit in front of your PlayStation, in front of your television set, and the book literally, you know, it comes to life. This is, this is more than what you could do on an iOS device right now. This is like on, on augmented reality on steroids. So we, we chose a story, it's a noir tale, about a, a bookworm detective who uh, has to figure out who bumped Humpty off the wall. So, wrapping it up, before I do though, there was a, one phone call that we couldn't ignore. Uh, Willy Wonka called, well, it was an assistant of his, and, and kind of, <laughs> kind of, kind of, what's kind of cool is that his agent is now our agent, and uh, Willie wants to reimagine his whole line of confections and, and, and wants to bring them back to the world. And it's not about merch for the movies that were based on his life, it's actually his store. And we actually uh, have been working restoring this store that's in Hollywood. It's right next to the Grauman Theater and in between the Dolby Theater. It's literally right there. And there are these uh, mechanical automated windows that we've designed that show different chapters in his life. And there's this one line of chocolates that we worked very hard on with him about uh, his journey. This is the street steamer trunk line. And uh, these are actual chocolates that we actually made 3D models of. And uh, they are being produced, and they're going to be outfitting this store in the next couple of weeks, and it'll be open soon. So yes, that parade you heard about, here it is. The, the people ask, why are you doing this in Shreveport? This is our answer. You do it yourself. You use technology to empower your artists and your community, and you are rewarded for it. They hadn't had a ticker tape parade since VJ Day, and I'm not saying we're anything like veterans or anything like that. I'm just saying, though, this was an incredible moment. This is a major milestone that cannot go and, and be ignored. <laughs> so. There you go, I'm coming back around. You know, I'm bookending it with the uh, chocolate milk again, but I do think it tastes better through two straws, and I hope you do too. So amazing. So amazing.